thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And thank you for taking the next step to becoming a team leader for our bug hunts. We could not do this program without people like you that are willing to go through some training and uh, take a leadership role. So uh, a couple things about tonight. This is the first time that we've done team leader training virtually. And we are taking uh, uh, almost a day long training and condensing it down into this one to one and a half hour training. And then this will be followed by the field portion, which we're doing on Saturday, April 10th. And I know most of you have registered for that. Uh, if you haven't, I, I sent you an email today. I also sent you a few things today. I sent you a packet of materials and then a link to macroinvertebrates.org, which is the place to go to practice your identification. So uh, I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Sally Petrella. I'm the monitoring manager. And I'm going to introduce a couple more people in a minute. Um, so uh, we're just going to, uh, we don't really have time for everybody to introduce themselves um, because, like I said, we're condensing a lot of things into a short period of time. Um, uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of background uh, on the watershed and uh, how we got this program started and what the program consists of. And then Sue Thompson will be covering uh, macroinvertebrate identification. Uh, we will do a little practice and I have a quiz for you. Uh, we'll probably stop after the identification to answer a few questions and Aaron will also monitor them along the way. And then uh, we also wanted to train you on how to, uh, uh, if you notice illicit discharges, how, what to look for and how to report them. And so we'll be covering that. So uh, just introductions. Uh, I already introduced myself. And then uh, Sue, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, Sue Thompson, a uh, longtime Friends of the Rouge um, volunteer and uh, bug hunt team leader, and also on the Friends of the Rouge board of directors. And in my day job, I'm uh, coordinate uh, monitoring with Friends of the Rouge uh, at Wayne County and all the water quality monitoring and the water and environment related um, things that go on at uh, Wayne County. Thank you, Sue. And Erin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Erin Cassidy. I'm the education manager at Friends of the Rouge, and we do this program with students and schools as well. So um, I'm here just as a supporting role and uh, happy to help out. Thank you, Erin. Make that, we go. So just, uh, uh, I know that uh, everybody who's attending, some of you are really good with benthic macroinvertebrates and some of you are relatively new to it. So we wanna just be on the, whole, on the same page here. So we call our events bug hunts uh, or stonefly searches but really we're looking for benthic macroinvertebrates. So what's the definition? Animal without a backbone that lives in the stream bed for part or all of its life and can be seen with the naked eye. While magnification might help, these things are not microscopic. And what are we talking about? Um, you know, not necessarily all aquatic insects, but we're looking for clams or the big mussels, worms, leeches, snails, uh, then things with legs like crayfish, things with a whole lot of legs like sow bugs and scuds, and then lastly, aquatic insects. And the aquatic insects are going to be the most sensitive of all of these. So these are the ones that you're going to have to spend the most time with the identification on. And you want to look at, um, you know, all of them are going to have the three pairs of legs. You're going to want to look at, look for antenna and tails and um, do they have gills, uh, things like that. And Sue so will go into that. So why do we collect macroinvertebrates? So people do this kind of monitoring all over the country, in fact, all over the world, uh, because um, you know these bugs live in the stream full time, and so their presence or absence is a really good indication of the localized uh, conditions. Uh, in addition to that, it's relatively easy to sample for them. Um, they're really at the bottom of the food chain. They, they, you know, if they're not there, you're not going to have any fish there. So they, they support support that. 
And then the, the communities are generally abundant. Uh, we do ask you to take some samples and preserve them. Um, but you know, these are insects, they have large numbers of, of young, so you're not gonna really hurt the population. And basically overall, the, um, the more different types of macroinvertebrates that you have at a site, the healthier your stream site is. And uh, we actually will show you the way that we come up with a score for a site based on how many of these sensitive uh, families you find, um, and then some of the tolerant ones too. If you're not finding uh, many bugs at your stream site, there's things that you might think about like Sedimentation is a huge problem in the rouge. Uh, a lot of these things use gills uh, to get their oxygen. And if there's a lot of sediment in the stream, they won't be able to survive. Habitat loss, and then of course, chemical pollution. So just a little background on the Rouge River water set shed. So it drains 467 square miles of land. And um, the Rouge River was once one of the most polluted rivers in the country. And it has four major branches, uh, 125 miles of stream. Uh, for the most part, most of the industrial pollution is down, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but down in the main stem, um, down towards the Ford Rouge plant and all that associated, associated industry around Zug Island. Um, so uh, most of those problems are, have been addressed or are being addressed, or there's a lot of legacy pollution down there that is being addressed. Uh, we still have a, a large problem with combined sewer overflows. Uh, a lot of the older communities in Detroit, Inkster, Redford, those areas, even Birmingham, uh, have sewers that uh, when they get inundated, um, they actually can flow into the river. So combined sewers take both sewage from the home as well as from the storm drains and combine them. And they have to have some sort of relief and the relief is to go into the river. And we still have situations where that's happening when you get enough rain. So uh, especially along the main branch down here. Um, for the most part, our sampling sites are out in the headwaters where we have the smaller streams because our protocol is based on weightable streams. Um, so those streams are actually um, our healthiest parts. The Johnson Creek out here in Salem, Northville, and Plymouth is a cold water trout stream. You've got the headwaters of Wald Lake. Some of the streams in the lower are our healthiest areas, uh, but as they travel downstream, um, you find more and more problems. So Friends of the Rouge started this program in 1998. We actually started it with a grant from the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. They wanted uh, us to train volunteers to do this type of monitoring. They gave us a protocol. They actually provided biologists to do the training. That's one of our first uh, class of trainees. When we started, we just did the training. Uh, and when people were done, we handed them a net. We let them keep that pair of waders and some equipment and said, we'd like you to find a spot on the stream, adopt it and sample it twice a year. When I came on in 2000, there were, I think, two people that had managed to adopt a site and were doing this on a regular basis. So we studied the Huron River Watershed Council's program because they had 100 people coming out to look for bugs. And that is because they use this group sampling format where they organize a day where everybody goes out and uh, they train team leaders like we do and the team leaders lead groups of volunteers. So that way you can sign up people that don't have experience um, that can go out uh, and, and help to look for bugs under the guidance of team leaders uh, of a team leader. And um, this, this protocol is much safer than handing somebody waiters and expecting them to go out on their own. And then it's also more of a social thing. People volunteer for different reasons and it's nice to be out there with other people and to meet them, even if that me today means you're wearing a mask, but um, nice to, to get to know other people that care about the river. So we started with a spring bug hunt, added a fall bug hunt, and then we also do the winter stonefly search where we're specifically looking for uh, the stoneflies that hatch out of the river in the winter time. And that event is sometimes even more popular than the other ones. And uh, why do we do this? 
So the, the state wanted us to do this to check for problems. Uh, they also use it for uh, their to look at when they're choosing the sites for their monitoring. They only monitor our watershed every five years. Uh, we give the data to the communities. Uh, the data is also used to assess restoration projects. Um, it's being used to help guide uh, restoration efforts. And then in addition to that, and Sue will talk about this a little bit more, but just the act of sending you out to stream sites and um, with your soon to be trained knowledge of what to look for, we have found lots of problems that never would have been seen maybe for years. Uh, things like raw sewage leaking into the river, things like a site Sue was at where hydraulic fluid was le leaking uh, from, the, from the fire department. Uh, collapsing stream banks, things like that. And by you being out there, uh, we get them reported and taken care of. So by, by joining this team as a team leader, you're really helping to contribute as a citizen scientist to make a big difference. So uh, when we do our sampling, uh, like I said, we actually calculate a, so a score for each site. So this is showing our data. We, you know, we started in 2001. So um, over all those years, these are average scores. So for the most part, as I told you, uh, our better sites are out in the Johnson Creek and the headwaters of the Middle Rouge, as well as some of the streams of the Lower Rouge. Uh, for the most part, sites in the Rouge River are considered fair. So I'm sorry, the green boxes are good, the, the yellow or orange are fair. And then we do uh, have some concerning areas. This is Evans Creek in Southfield, and that creek actually goes underneath the Southfield Civic Center. It's almost just more like a great big storm drain than like a real stream. And as a result of some of the sampling we've done and other efforts, it's actually scheduled for some improvement projects. Uh, other issues down in the middle, as you go downstream on the middle, water quality does uh, decline. And part of that might just be all the water that's going in there. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but um, you know, 70% of the problem of the pollution in the river has to do with storm water. Uh, polluted stormwater, too much stormwater going in, which is why Friends of the Rouge has really embraced getting people to put in green infrastructure, to put in rain barrels, to install a rain garden, to put in pervious pavement, to try to eliminate the amount of paved surfaces, because the more things that we can do to get water to infiltrate rather than run off, the healthier our streams will be. Because when you think about it, sending all the water straight to our streams puts polluted water in there. It also makes our streams go way up and then way down, causing a lot of erosion and sedimentation and makes it very challenging for the macroinvertebrates and the fish to live there. So um, with our program, uh, we do a system that was handed to us from the Department of Environmental Quality that eventually uh, was turned over to the Michigan Clean Water Corps, something Governor uh, Jennifer Granholm started. Um, it's kind of an oversight of monitoring programs throughout the state. And uh, this is the form that you use when you go out on the field to ask you some basic information about the site. And we usually provide the location, um, uh, latitude, longitude, that kind of information. Um, but I'm showing you this right now and, and we will actually cover this when we go out into the field. Uh, there some, some programs around the country use an index of biological integrity, a way of kind of scoring a site based on the bugs that you found. We use what's called a stream quality score. And basically, uh, they have divided up the uh, benthic macroinvertebrate, mainly orders, into sensitive, somewhat sensitive, and tolerant. Uh, and the somewhat sensitive are going to be things like your stoneflies, your mayflies, your case building caddisflies. Uh, and then as you go down to somewhat sensitive, things like your crayfish, your damselflies, your scuds, sow bugs. And then there's the tolerant category of things like um, midge larvae and worms and leeches. They're not bad, but um, they're, they're pretty tolerant. And each one of these, when you're, when you're scoring this, you're gonna um, figure out whether you have 10 or more or one to 10, and that would be common, I'm sorry, rare. 
So one to 10 would be rare and uh, 11 or more would be common. And then you can see if caddis larva were, caddis fly larva were common, you'd get a 5.3 in the top category. Um, whereas down here in tolerance, if you have aquatic worms are common, you just get a one. So it's sort of um, weighted based on sensitivity as well as number that you find in, in your, um, uh, your whole uh, group of insects and benthic macroinvertebrates that you find. And um, we also ask you to look for invasive species. So, um, I am, so uh, like I said, then you come up with a total score and basically in the Rouge River, our scores range from, you know, I think we've gotten as low as seven and I think our highest score was 62. So you may be able to correct me there. Um, and then those uh, scores actually are translated into categories of excellent, good, fair, and poor. And that's what I was showing you on the map back there. The vast majority of our sites are in the fair range. Um, and in that packet that I sent to you, you actually can uh, look at that form. Um, um, you'll see how to do that. And we'll teach that to you out in the field. So uh, I am Ellie, going, yes? It looks like Rachel has her hand raised. I don't, she hasn't typed anything in the, um, chat or the Q&A, but I, I just wanted to call attention to that in case there was a question. Um, Rachel, I just made you made it possible for you to talk. Do you have a question or something to say? And uh, has to unmute. And Rachel is actually uh, one of our uh, trained team leaders. So she's a little bit more of an expert here. Maybe it was just an accident. I just wanted to okay. pay attention to it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, th thanks for joining us, Rachel. Great. Um, and feel free to type into the chat if you have a question or any, in, uh, or use the question and answer for questions. So uh, let me turn it over to Sue. Okay. Thank you, Sally. I'll do. Um, I'll just let you know to advance the next slide since um, since uh, you're the have the presentation and. Um, that'll probably help as we go through. Um, thanks. Um, okay, the first group that we're going to introduce is uh, Sally broke down broke down the uh, the uh, scoring form for you and uh, the insects and the critters that we're looking for are broken down into the different orders. So, as a team leader, one of the things that we'll be doing in the field uh, when we're going through the samples with uh, with your team is is sorting when they're sorting through the insects and putting them in the in, in, um, ice cube trays then um, your task with um, sorting them together and getting them in those groups so we can make the count like Sally talked about to count those number of different individuals and, and to decide what is common, which group, what's rare, and to be able to do your, do your uh, stream quality score within the field. Um, so our next series of slides is actually going to go through and we're going to show you pictures and some of those things of how you can tell, um, how you can tell these different um, insects and different critters apart because um, I know some of you are, are really uh, adept at ID and then others of you are like, oh my gosh, what's what's the difference between the caddis fly and the, the damsel fly? And, and so this next series, we're going to try to uh, give you some of those keys and clues of how do I um, help with that with that ID when you're out in the field with, with your team and, and going through your samples. So our first group that we're going to be looking at today is uh, the caddis flies, which are very, um, very, um, very diverse group and uh, very interesting to look at. So uh, we'll see some different ranges here. Um, next, um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, some of the keys to the uh, the caddis flies. Um, some of the ones that are pointed out here on this uh, on this slide are um, unless you have a super large specimen um, or you've got really good eyes, which you, you may have. Uh, some of them are, are going to be harder to see, and so. Some of it you're just looking for, for the body forms um, and we're looking for things that are insects. So they're gonna have the three legs on the, um, on the thorax and the abdomen. Um, but uh, for instance, the caddis flies, we'll see that they have the three pairs of legs because they're the insect. Um, the, the tarsal claw, which tarsal is just uh, referring to the foot or in this case, I just consider it the, the toe. Um, some of the specimens you may be able to see it in because they're big enough that you can only see one claw versus multiple claws. 
Um, and then there's the prolegs or, or these fleshy uh, protuberances that are on the, the end of the abdomen, um, which, which help you differentiate um, being a caddis, caddis fly. Um, these, this looks like the case, uh, the case builder types if you were to see it without its um, protective case. Um, next slide. So caddis flies, um, caddis flies that we're looking at the case builders, which we call the case builders. And there's also the free living style caddis flies as well that would fit into this category, but they are classified as group ones. Uh, they would be our, our, most, our most sensitive groups. So we would get the most points for those. But you can see in the pictures here, um, the, the, their caddis flies are so fascinating because they, um, they can make their cases out of the different substrate that they're finding in their habitat. So you see here the habitat and things are very key for um, their being able to actually exist at a site. But they use things like anything from, um, from bark to little, little sand pebbles like you, like you see in some of the... Um, uh, some of the cases there with the one that looks like the snail and then on the one on the far right that's or my right that's um looks like a log cabin um so the case can actually help you um differentiate the insect but keep in mind just think if the, that um if that habitat wasn't there at that uh, particular site that though that would be a challenge for those insects to live there um the next slide um, so you can see here, there is one caddis fly that uh, this is actually ironically the more common one that we find in the rouge. Um, but uh, this one is categorized as group two. It is, is pulled out of group one because it is common, but it is uh, also uh, more tolerant than the other case builders that you saw. The ones that we had there are, are a little bit more sensitive. And then due to the, the, the things that they need to help build their, their homes and that makes them, makes them more sensitive. So caddis, the net spinners are more uh, uh, less sensitive, so we actually score them a little bit uh, separately. And um, what's interesting with them is you they have the three plates on the top of their head there, the, the diagram up to the upper upper left there. And um, they are interesting because once they colonize a certain area, you find them under, in rocks, under rocks and in riffles. And so they build these, um, these uh, silk nets that they actually filter feed. So. Um, but they are, um, and then there's the, the adult form there when they when they hatch out. So again, um, they are they are good uh, good fish food. Um, next uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's another group one. Um, looks pretty scary here if you encounter these. Fortunately, the ones in the rouge don't get as large as uh, if you're in a trout stream out out in the western environment, environs in Montana or even even in uh, northern Michigan. Um, with the, with the uh, when you look at the size of the mandibles, um, but these are these are very sensitive uh, uh, th families as well. I do believe we find most we found them in the um, mostly in the main. I do believe in uh, is is where they're, they're, we found them most in the rouge. Uh, so they are yeah the big jaws and then as they as they're adults fortunately we're in the situation when you look at the mandibles uh, in the adult forms when they hatch into their adult forms they they don't bite so. Um, but the larger specimens, you can actually find them. They'll try to, um, they'll try to bite you. But thankfully, the ones in the rouge aren't aren't that big. So we don't want to scare you away from dropping out of your 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 bug hunt and sign up here. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, another relative to the uh, the Helgramite is the alderfly, and the alderfly is uh, is in group two. It is not as sensitive as as the Helgramites, and also they're not as large, and they have the um, the single filament on the end of their 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 bodies as opposed to um, just kind of like a a, a a tail that kind of holds on to things. And their their mandibles aren't nearly as um, aren't nearly as scary. Um, next slide, please. Yep, so this slide, this slide is what differentiates if you were to get the lucky enough to get the two of um, in the same sample. So the Helgramite on the top is, is just, it's a much larger organism and then the, it has these, these appendages which kind of help it hold on to rocks in that, um, as opposed to the elderfly, which has that, uh, the single kind of that full form looking, looking fuzzy tail there. So, um, and again, not the large uh, jaws on it. So the, that helps you differentiate the two very well. Uh, next, please. Okay, mayflies, um, group one. And so uh, there's some uh, pictures of some of the different ones um, that we can find. Again, this is a very, um, this is a very diverse um, order as well in terms of different types of, um, of families. Um, next, please. 
Uh, so mayflies, if you uh, find them in your find them in your sample, you'd be looking for uh, gills on their abdominal segments, uh, which is which is very distinct. Um, and also the biggest the biggest uh, differentiating point is the um, they have three tails. Um, you may want to look because what will happen when sometimes when you're sampling, um, you may break a tail off. So you just want to check at the bottom of the abdomen just to make sure that there isn't one broken off that's that leaves just two tails because that is confusing with um, some other with some other insect orders. But that's um, and mayflies again, you know, six six legs again because they're aquatic aquatic insects. Next, please. Here's um here's a few different forms of some of the mayflies. Um, and the one off to the, the right uh, there in the in the diagram is this is one we do find in the rouge. It's the prongill mayfly, and you can see by the by the gills it, it, they're very very um, they're very fragile, so they will tend to get broken off when they're when they're when they're when they're sampled and then they're collected. Um, and you'll you'll see them as well as the tails. Uh, and uh, again, also the, the mayflies that crawl on the bottom of rocks. So when you turn rocks over um, in your trays, um, you may may find those find those as well. The one in the the one on the bottom uh, left is um, it's really cool. It's called the armored mayfly. Unfortunately, we don't find it in the rouge, but it uh, it does look like a a, a little tank. So you can kind of see the the differences just in uh, the body forms between the between the uh, families. Uh, next. Uh, here's another group one that's a, a non-insect form. This is a, a gilled snail. Um, and the reason why they're in group one is because they have gills. So they're breathing directly out of the water like a, like a fish or even getting oxygen like a may, mayfly or may, mayfly would. Um, but uh, the cool thing with them is they have a, they have a, what's called an operculum per, or a door so that if they get startled and to protect themselves from predators, they, they pull their body in and slam that, slam that door so that it's hard for them to get eaten. Um, and how we tell them in the field if you're getting snails in your sample is to hold them up in your hand and, when, and hold it with the, uh, the, the, um, the tip of the snail upward. And if the shell is opening on the right hand side or pointing to the right, that's the right handed snail, that's the gilt snail. And we'll talk about the pouch snails um, uh, later on. Um, next, please. All right, here is a Friends of the Rouge's favorite favorite insect here that they make us go out, or I should say make us, That's, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? Um, we go out and we send our, our teams out into the coldness of January to look for these special insects. Um, these are very sensitive um, and uh, we are fortunate that we, we can find them in the watershed and, and uh, are successful in our missions to find them. And they are uh, group ones, as we mentioned, they're sensitive. Um, and what's cool about the stonefly is, is that um, they hatch out the, the families that we look for in the winter time are hatching out in the winter because they've uh, evolved to avoid predation from fish. Fish in the winter time are very slow because the water temperature is, is colder so there's not a whole lot happening so they're, they're kind of chilling out. So the stoneflies, which aren't very good flyers, when you take a look at their, their picture there with the, their, their wings, they don't fly very far. They're, 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 they're very clumsy flying, so they don't go very far from the streams typically. Um, so this helps give them a leg up on, um, on the um, avoiding predation. Because you think about when um, in the spring, when a lot of the mayflies and, and um, things hatch and the fish are in the fish and the um, are more active that this 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 um this helps them survive. So um, next slide. So to help us identify the, the special stoneflies is um, they have very very long antenna on the, the tops of their heads. Um, in the in the larger more developed specimens we'll see the, the two sets of wing pads on um, on the thorax and then the big key with them is the two long filamentous tails which as you see with the mayflies, the mayflies have the three filamentous tails, so these um, these uh, specimens would have two. There's only one mayfly that does have two tails, and that is one that we do not find in, in this area in Michigan. Next, please. 
here's some um, here's some photos and some uh, diagrams of our of our sunflies um, to give you an idea of just the different the different body types that we have. Um, so the one on the upper right is the uh, the slender winter stonefly, um, which we were looking for out in in, in January, which is the more common uh, variety that's found in the rouge. Um, then we also have the pattern stoneflies, which is the one here on the the left. Um, we do find those in, in several locations uh, out in uh, like Johnson Creek is is one area where they're they're found commonly. And then down here in the bottom one, we have the Taney today, which um, which is a broadback stonefly, which we actually found people seen them um, hatching out in the concrete channel. They're they're a little bit more of a tolerant type stonefly, and they like larger rivers. So um, it is really good news that um, the the rouge has improved to the level that it can support these types of, of stoneflies that far downstream. So that's really exciting. So um, next. Um, Next group one is water pennies, and uh, as you can see here, this one is uh, this one's pretty unique. Uh, you'd have it on the bottom of a rock and look at this little brown spot and not uh, really know what it is. But when you uh, pull it off the uh, rock and you turn it over and see that it's got legs, um, that it's a, um, a, a beetle larva. And there happens to be one site in the Rouge that um, it is it is found in, and is actually one of the sites that we use for for our um, monitoring training, and that's at uh, Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Township Park. So um, maybe we'll be fortunate when we visit there, the, the, the team, lead, team leaders are going there to train that we'll um, take a look and hopefully we'll find some. Um, next, please. Uh, another group one um, that we do find uh, in the Rouge, uh, uh, not horribly commonly, but they're out there, is uh, the water snake flies. And uh, they are pretty, pretty unique uh, looking. Uh, they have these this pretty wrinkled body. They have this fuzzy, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy uh, tail, and then they have these these um, the protuberances coming off their their abdomen, so they look really wrinkled. Um, so if we're fortunate enough that we'll be able to uh, to find those. So our, our group two is uh, beetles, uh, and beetles are an incredibly um, diverse group as well. And, and um, on our MyCore form, we actually differentiate um, the beetle larvae versus the uh, beetle adults when you're finding those in the sample, and you'll get uh, points for, for each of those. Uh, next. Okay, for the beetle larvae, here's uh, some of the distinctive uh, features of those. Um, they have the chewing or biting mouth parts um, at, the, at the top of their head there. Um, again, they're an insect, so they've got the three pairs of legs um, on their, their thorax. And um, the body is just really, really, really hard, and that's what sclerotize means. So you can, you can grab it with your, your forceps and that, so you will, you'll, get some, you'll get some pushback. It's not squishy like a... Like a, if you, I don't don't advise you to squish the bugs, but if you do, when you if you just touch them with your your forceps, you'll, you'll notice a difference with the beetles being being with that tougher outer shell versus some of our other insects that are more um, more um, more uh, they don't have that uh, that covering. Next. So here's our beetle adults. Um, again, they have uh, the, the large uh, antennae, typically, uh, again, the, the hardened wings. Their whole, all their wings right down, to the, right down to the end of their abdomen are, are hardened. And, um, and then they have if this, when you get to go to identify beetles, they are challenging, um, one of the more challenging families um, to identify just because it's hard to differentiate some of the, uh, some of the, the different hind leg parts when you're trying to the specimen when they're they have the darker color to differentiate all these. Um, but the shell-like wings are um, that something you can easily identify in the in the field. Um, next, here's some examples of some of the different beetles uh, that we find uh, throughout the watershed. Um, and like the one up in the upper left there, the large one that's a predaceous diving beetle. And then the ones down here in the um, the bottom here is you have a riffle beetle. That's um, and then also it's larvae. So you can just see the and you may get those in the same the same sample as as well. Um, one of the unique things with beetles and the, the picture up the top is it looks like maybe a crawling water beetle. Is um, it's got the they the, the they can hold they can hold oxygen under their under their shells or in a, what's called a plastron, kind of like a little scuba tank that they keep on board to help them so they can stay underwater longer. So that's one of the unique features of, um, of beetles. 
Next. Black fly, everyone's favorite that goes to hike in the park, right? <laughs> um, there's, they're um, in, in group two. Um, and what's they're kind of interesting, actually, when uh, you look at them, they're these bowling pin shaped things. When you pick them up on the rock, um, they'll, they're actually attached and they're, they're filter feeders. So you can see by the pictures there that usually if there's one, there's like a whole bunch of them. Um, and uh, they extend their labral, their, their mouth parts out um, into the stream. And so they, they feed on just the detritus that's getting um, getting um, getting um, moved down the river by the current. So you can see here that if um, they would not be able to survive in a stream that did not have fast moving water, it wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be able to eat as effectively. So um, that's the, the interesting key with the, uh, the black flies. Of course, they hatch out into the, the biting insects that we all know and love when we do go venture into the venture in the woods or by the stream um, um, during, during quote unquote fly season in Michigan. So, um, next, please. Uh, clams are clams are are a group two, uh, somewhat sensitive as well, and so we do have um, several different types here um, in the rouge. And so the ones off to the left, uh, those are those are actually freshwater mussels. So we are very fortunate if we were to find those at your site. Um, and uh, just if anything, you take a picture of them and send them to Sally. So they're not as common as they used to be. The, um, the mussels, unfortunately, are declining in some of the, the, the sites here on the Rouge. So we don't find them as much as we used to. Um, and, uh, but uh, they are still here to some extent. And uh, the ones off to the right are uh, the, the real small ones. You can see how small that is. That's what's called the fingernail clam. So it is much smaller than the, the fingernail there that it's next to as a scale. Um, so those are, those are the different types of clams we have in the rouge. And then on the bottom, we have the, with the line, red line drawn across it are zebra mussels. So um, those are ones that you may find at your site. They do not count as as uh, part of the clams, but we would note that if you're finding live zebra mussels to put those there as a section on the um, on the uh, form that uh, we would ask you to note that they are, are there so we can keep track of what sites have invasive species throughout the watershed. Next, please. Uh, crane fly um, is another group too. And so this one as well, it starts off its larval form in, um, in this uh, big fleshy, kind of scary looking um, thing that tends to crawl out of your ice cube tray when you leave it on your on your tarp. Um, and it does hatch out into a, a very big uh, mosquito-like um, um, insect. So they are very important in our streams because they do help break down leaf litter. Um, uh, so they're, they're very important in ecosystem. Next, please. Crayfish um, are a, another group too. And of course, uh, non-insects, but um, they, um, we find them in various sizes in the rouge um, throughout um, the, the water system. And so far, the ones we typically find are native. Um, we uh, are on the lookout for the one in the bottom left there, which is, has the line through it, which is the, uh, the red swamp crayfish, which was a, is an issue that was a fear that it was going to um, invade in the upper rouge. And so fortunately, so far, um, it hasn't shown up anywhere, nor do we have rusties, rusty crayfishes that I'm aware of in the, in the rouge. But um, keep an eye out for things that look um, different than your, um, your, your northern clearwater crayfish, which is our more common crayfish in the, in the rouge. Um, next, please. Okay, uh, dragon, dragonflies and damselflies are another one of our group twos, and uh, so we'll differentiate um, those, um, those uh, orders next for you. Okay, how we tell them uh, apart is you can see here the the in the upper left there is the damselfly is long, long and long and thinner, and then it has the paddle-like tails and the distinct antennae. Um, and then the um, the dragonflies have also have distinct antennae and, and very large eyes, you know, because they're they're both they're both uh, predator predatory. Um, and they both have the extendable lower jaw to 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 engulf prey, but the body types are, are different between the two. Um, next slide, please. So here's the differentiating thing. If you were to get them in the same sample, um, you know, the, the dragonfly has a much stouter, more robust body. It does not have the three paddle-like tails. 
Um, it uses its um, it uses its uh, rear end there for for jet propulsion, but again, it's not it's not a distinct tail, um, as opposed to the damselfly, which does have that long slender body, three tails. Um, one thing the tails do tend to get broken off because they actually are the gills. Um, they do get broken off when we collect, so sometimes the specimen will get confused with a stonefly or a mayfly because people look at the number of tails. So keep an eye on what the, the head shape looks like in the eyes and also the antennae, which are different than your stonefly and your, your, your mayfly if you were to happen to encounter that. Um, next, please. So here's, so here's some um, pictures of what um, dragonflies look like like um, just kind of close up to give you an idea here again you see the the larger eyes you know the antenna and just that that very uh, very robust robust body type next and here's the the, the damselflies as, as a contrast to that again long longer and thinner body um, and then with the three three distinct paddle like tails um, so our group two is a uh, scud. This is a, a non-insect that's uh, common in the rouge and they're also called side swimmers. Uh, they tend to, to swim on their sides and they are related to, um, to our um, you know, aquatic um, shrimp or, or shrimp that are found in the um, uh, salt water. Next. In another group two, uh, it's a non-insect is our, our saw box. So they have, um, they have um, many different legs when you see them crawling around on the, uh, the bottom of your tray. They have these distinctive uh, little, um, little stabilizers at the end of their body and then they also have long antenna. Um, so uh, you may be finding those and a lot of segments in their body too. Uh, next. Um, here's our, our first group three, which is our tolerance uh, group, and that's uh, aquatic worms, uh, which we do find uh, they're very segmented. So we do find those in the sediment of, of our samples and, um, you know, they're very tolerant. So um, next. Here's another tolerant thing that uh, always is a thrill for your um, young, young team leaders. Um, they like to hang in the bottom of the trays and um, they have the muscular body and uh, the, the, the segments and the, the sucker that helps them hang on to the tray um, and their, their substrate that they, they live on in the stream. Um, next, please. All right, another group three here is uh, the midges. Uh, midges are a larval form of, of, of a fly. Um, so these, these are the common ones. You might find the ones that are, that are red due to they live down in the sediments. Um, and so I have that, the red in there to help um, the hemoglobin to help them uh, get oxygen out of the water, as well as some of the other free living tribes of, of midges. So they are, um, they are very tolerant. Um, next, please. Okay, um, I mentioned uh, snails earlier. We talked about the guild snail in uh, group one. So we're in uh, group three here, the pouch snails, which are tolerant. Um, if we get these, um, they don't have the, the plate-like covering on the operculum um, as, as the guild snail would. And when you hold them in your, in your hands, the ones that have the tall spires, the, the spire will open to the left as opposed to the right. Um, so that's how you would tell the difference with the um, versus the guild snail. Some of the ones they want to play tricks on you because then we have the ones that are flattened and that they, they don't have the spires so that you can't hold it one way or the other. Um, but it doesn't have they won't have the coils. And then we also have the ones that um, that look like little hats um, that will be down at the bottom of your tray. Those are the limpet snails. Um, so those are all pouch snails uh, that would be scored in group three. Um, next, please. Okay, um, we also have uh, the true bugs, and these, um, what makes them distinctive is they have very scary uh, tube-like sucking mouth parts, which pierce their prey, um, and then what differentiates them um, from confu getting confused with the beetles is their, their wings are hard and near the, the end of their body or their base, but then they're, they're very membranous um, elsewhere. Um, so that way they can't be confused um, with the beetles. But again, the difference is the mouth parts are, are really distinctive on the true bugs versus um, what the beetles would look like. Um, next. Okay, here's some examples of these. Um, and true bugs are, are a very diverse group. And the ones I mentioned with the biting mouth parts is the one here up at the upper right. Um, fortunately, the, um, um, the giant water bug does not get that big here in the roof. So we don't have to worry about those. Um, 
uh, attacking. And then so we do have some of the other um, some of the other the water striders and the water boatmen that we do see uh, very commonly in the Rouge. And then here hiding in the, the vegetation there is the uh, water scorpion, uh, which we do find in some of these streams that would have some vegetation. So uh, next. All right. Um, other true flies. Um, true flies are a very diverse group. And so some of the sensitive ones you see are broken out into the different uh, groups. Um, but the flies here, we do have a diverse um, range. And uh, so these would be some of the other ones that we would find in the Rouge. We you know, find the, like the soldier flies as well as, um, as, well as, the, um, as well as the no seam style that's below that. Um, some of the Dixon midges and then just, um, um, you know, the horse flies. Um, we do, do find horse flies and deer flies as well. So. Um, next. All right. Thank you, Sue. That was a lot of bugs in a short period of time. So I hope you all were paying attention. Uh, we have an opportunity to go through a couple practice bugs. So if you wanna uh, uh, take a look, I sent you both a dichotomous key that you could use. Uh, a, and I also sent you um, something produced by the Isaac Walton League, which uh, has, uh, we generally use that because it has all of the bugs on one page, although they don't use the same categories. Um, but let's start uh, with um, this guy right here. And um, so you look at this thing, it's got a lot of legs, maybe tails, not sure. Um, so let me, uh, I guess, uh, if you want to raise your hand, if you think that you know what this one is, then I think I can unmute. Okay, looks like Jackie knows, she ought to know, anybody else? Many legs, so probably not an aquatic insect. Anybody else, Sam? I'll let Sam try to answer this one because he's relatively new. So Sam, what do you think this guy is? I just unmuted you. Is it a sow bug? Yep. Mm -hmm. Great, great job. Anybody got any questions about that? So the kind of the armored body and the many, many legs. Similar family to the scuds, but this is uh, kind of like your, your roly poly, your pill bug. Uh, so moving on to the next one. Uh, what might this be? And I'll do a trick part of it too. Do you know what category it goes in? So looks like Allison has raised her hand on this one. What do we got here? That is the net spinner, and I think it's group two. Perfect. Yeah. So net spinner what? Oh, sorry. Net spinner what? Net spinner. Oh, oh. Sorry, I forget the name. I'm blanking out. <laughs> <laughs> I know you know what it is. So net spinner <laughs> caddisfly. Caddisfly. Yeah, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this would be in the sensitive category because um, it's a caddis fly. So it's got kind of a fleshy body and that and the three pairs of legs. Um, but then the caddis flies with the three plates are the net spinners. And those are actually category two. So great job, Allison. OK, one more. So uh, look carefully at this guy right here. Sue just talked about it. And uh, somebody else want to hazard a guess? Somebody new? There's a whole category that you might know the specific name of this, and then I'd really want to know which category it goes into, and it's based on some of the parts that you see. So, Christina, what have we got here? Um, I think that's a water strider and it's in the true bugs. All right, great job. Yep, and you see that, uh, see that piercing mouth part right there would put it in the true bug family. So, okay, um, great job. So what I'm gonna try now is I have a poll that's kind of a quiz 
And um, I am going to launch the polling. I'm going to put it right over here. Launch the polling. Um, can you see it? This is the quiz. Uh, okay, can you see, can everybody see the quiz? Somebody want to give me a yes yeah. or no? Okay, great. So um, this is number one. So we'd like you to identify, this is slide number one. Uh, it's a multiple choice. So um, this one has kind of attachers down here and then these sort of feathery things up here. So does anybody know what that is in the poll? Are you guys able to, to, to vote in this poll? I don't see anybody has figured it out. So um, I'm gonna, um, um, it gives all the questions at a time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all six of them are, you would have to answer all six for you to see the results, Sally. Oh, okay. So, so okay. So, is everybody able to answer the first one? Should I should I go on? Okay, okay. I'm just going to move on though. So, you had enough time with one. This is number two. So, I'll identify the bug. Number two. So, I'll give you a minute on that. Note how many tails it has on its head. Okay, moving on to three. This is number three. Okay. Uh, moving on to number four. Big head, broad body. Let's see, number five. Beautiful specimen here. And it's showing off the main characteristic, no broken tails. So, and I think this is our last one. This would be number six. I am correct. It looks like I see now that you, uh, now that some people have fill, filled the entire thing out, um, I'm starting to see the, the uh, results. So does anybody need me to go back to any of them? Are you guys experts? It's looking pretty good. So it looks like six out of 13 have voted. I'll just run through each one real quickly and then we're gonna announce this. So this was number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. And uh, let's see if I, it looks like seven out of 13 have voted. Anybody need another minute? like eight of 13. And we're kind of out of running out of time here. So I'm going to end the polling and I am going to share the results with you. So let me run back through. Okay. So it uh, looks like a hundred percent of you got the black fly larva. Good job. Um, number two, uh, looks like one person thought this was a mayfly, which is uh, logical because it does have the three tails, uh, but notice that they're paddle-like tails. So the correct answer would be damselfly. Uh, next one, um, this is a water beetle. If you note that line down the middle and those are kind of hardened wings, maybe a little bit hard to see in the picture. Um, I guess we're not showing the mouth part, so you didn't have that to look at. Um, one person did uh, think true bug and they, they do often confuse you. So you have to look a little bit closely at mouth parts, but with that line down the middle, that's gonna tell you true, that's gonna tell you beetle, not bug. So good job. Um, this one, number four, uh, looks like most of you correctly guessed dragonfly nymph. Uh, one person did say damselfly and that's, that's close because it's re closely related, has the big head, but the dragonfly is the broad body, the damselfly is the long thin body. 
And then right here, this three-tailed thing looks like everybody got this beautiful mayfly, correct? With the three tails and the abdominal gills. And then last but not least, um, this looks like this was a harder one. And I don't know, I hope I didn't confuse you because one of the tails is a little bit broken off, but two tails, wing pads, this is gonna be our favorite bug, the stonefly. So one person thought helgramite, which they're similar, but the helgramites have those projections that come out of the lower body. And then somebody else said mayfly, um, but this one does have the two tails, not the three tails. Uh, granted, one's a little bit broken off. So um, you guys did a fantastic job, awesome, awesome. And what I uh, would like to ask you to do, because we're really uh, running uh, short on time, hey, is Sally, um, yes, we we do have a question in the in the Q and A that says, "Is there a difference between a nymph and a naid?" I don't know how to say that. N n a i a d. A nymph and a naiad. Uh, Sue, naiad. do you want to take that one? Um, I'd say for here, it's like we're looking at um, the, the nymphs, the ones that we're looking at, the nymphs or immature specimens. Um, and I'd probably a naiad is probably another way of just depending on the nomenclature of the keys that you're looking at. But I, I'd be looking at nymphs because typically when we're looking at um, uh, keys to identify aquatic insects, it's, it's nymphs are the immature specimens. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, hope that helps. Uh, any other questions? So uh, we wanted to direct you uh, when you're done, when you have some time to go to macroinvertebrates.org. So it's a, it's a wonderful site that was created on kind of a free platform a few years ago, and it's an excellent, excellent resource. Um, so you can go there and you can look at all, all um, all the different orders and lots of different specimen photos and they highlight the characteristics. And what I would like to ask you to do um, in the next week or two is to also go to uh, the part where you can take a quiz. So after you've spent some time looking at those, uh, they have an even better quiz uh, than I had there, although it's similar multiple choice. Um, this would be the time that we would be giving you live material to look at and preserve specimens, um, but obviously we can't, we can't do that, but it's really nice to get your hands on them. And who wants to tell me what this thing is right here? Michael, what is that? Is that, <clears throat> is that a case builder? Yep, case builder what? Caddisfly? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, great job. Yes, and great to have you on tonight. Michael was our intern last year, so. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, okay, good job. So um, so I would like all of you, that's your assignment, um, to uh, study. And uh, I hope that you can bear with us uh, for, uh, I, I was trying to end this by um, seven, but it's a lot of material to cover. But this last part, um, like I said, since you are out there uh, looking at stream sites that most people don't get to, we just want you to keep your eyes open and there's things that we want you to look for. Um, some of you might've seen this photo. This was actually one of our team leaders who got up one morning in December and looked at the stream behind his house and this is what it saw, he saw. So it ended up being some dye they were using to test. Uh, a floor drain in a house, which obviously was misconnected and uh, actually the, the sewage was going directly into the river um, and the dye traced it, but it was a bit more dye than they should have used. So it was a pretty appalling sight. But anyway, because Bill saw that and he knew what to do, he knew, to, who, knew, he knew who to call, uh, the state got notified right away and um, it, it got addressed. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sue um to uh, tell you a little bit about what you should be looking for in addition to the bugs out there okay um thanks sally yeah as as, as sally said um as a team leader just uh when we're out with our teams or just out uh walking around in our in our in, in our everyday lives um the more eyes and ears that um are out there to be able to be aware of what pollution sources are and to report them is really important. Um, and Friends of the Rouge volunteers have been very instrumental in reporting 
um, some issues um, to um, local units of government in the state of Michigan to get um, these pollution sources um, checked on. So the next series of slides is going to be introducing some of these things to you and uh, to give you an idea um, what they look like and what to report. Um, but one of the things that's key here, as Sally mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, she talked about uh, the water quality in the Rouge. And um, one of the things that connects the Rouge um, to makes, uh, makes things a, a challenge is all the impervious surface we have. Um, all, the, all the development that's happened throughout the watershed, the, the roads, the, the paved surfaces, all that goes, that water goes off rather than getting absorbed into, absorbed into the, um, the landscape. It's, it's going directly out into to a stream or river. And in most cases, it's not treated. Um, Sally talked about the combined sewers and that, which in, are in the areas um, of the watershed where the water would be going to the, the wastewater treatment plant to get treated before it would get discharged to the stream. But in the case of where there's storm drains, that isn't happening. That water goes out directly untreated. Um, and Sally talked about what happens during rain events, um, in storm events, which when the, the water can't be treated. Um, but what that gives us is a direct connect to our, to our streams and rivers. And that's what's so important when it comes to, to contributing pollutants directly to our, our watershed. So these are some of the series of slides that we're gonna show that talk about those types of pollutants. Um, so next, please. Um, so these are some of the things that we may, we may encounter from time to time um, that uh, uh, you may see, or, or at least uh, we want to make you aware of what things look like to report. Um, uh, local units of government in the state of Michigan, one of the things that, uh, that uh, have, uh, communities have as part of their stormwater permits is uh, we're supposed to be trying to work on controlling um, and addressing areas of, of pollution. And unfortunately, uh, the more eyes and ears that uh, we can have to help report these issues, because there's just not enough paid staff out um, looking for looking for these types of things on a regular basis. So the volunteer eyes and ears, the more people that are that are made aware of these are are, are so key to get these pollution sources um, um, under control. Uh, but one of those is septic fields. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, sewer systems and um, and what happens with those. But there are areas of the watershed where there are still what's called on-site sewage disposal systems, where the house has its own treatment facility where the wastewater goes into a tank, uh, gets settled out, and the wastewater, um, the, the set of um, the um, uh, a field uh, full of um, full of, the, um, of sand in that will help treat the, 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 the water before it goes into the groundwater. Um, if these systems aren't maintained properly, they do, um, they do fail. Um, when they fail, so then you're going to have a uh, direct sewage source, um, which of course is public health issue as well as a, a water quality issue. So that's the gray water that you're seeing there in the upper upper left. Um, also, we have the discoloration. If you were to see a sewage source uh, actively uh, impacting a waterway, you might be seeing some of that, the gray water, and maybe even get a um, really sharp um, a pungent sewage odor with it and turbidity. So those are things that you would see in those two pictures. Um, up in the upper right, you're seeing kind of the chocolate milk color um, where you're seeing a, a, a construction site that they are not holding uh, the soil back um, while there's earth disturbance going on. And um, sediment, as, as Sally mentioned, is a challenge in the Rouge and that also is what impacts our aquatic life. Um, the sediment in the water plugs the gills of, of our fish and of our aquatic insects and also settles on the bottom of the stream. So it impacts the habitat. So those are um, why sediment is such a key in addition to carrying pollutants into, into the river. So um, uh, those are something that you may, uh, may observe um, if you're out and especially with all the construction that's going on all over in the, in the watershed, it's, it's, it's very prevalent uh, today with a lot of active construction sites. In the bottom here, we have um, a stream that's getting a little bit too much love um, from uh, over fertilization, which then runs off if people fertilize um, before a rain. Um, it's going to end up in the stream and river and then also just clog up um, um, with algae and plant growth, which, you know, um, takes away the dissolved oxygen out of the stream, which is, is problematic. Um, next, please. Um, here are just some, some additional um, pollution sources. 
um, is is up here. We see the classic rainbow sheen from an oil um, oil um, discharge. And um, Friends of the Rouge, those volunteers actually identified an active um, oil spill going on, a petroleum spill going on that was effectively um, handled by uh, by DEQ in, in, in Washtenaw County um, up in, in that area. Um, also things that uh, do, do present um, um, issues that we may not see is just uh, from pipes. Uh, there are some um, areas in the watershed where there are, there are direct connects from the building, um, like the one that was um, you saw the green the green from and the, the, the slide Sally showed of the river turning green and with the dye test of the home that the fixtures were connected directly in the stream. It happens more than you think of in, um, in the Rouge. Um, and um, we found many of those are, 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 are found um, regularly throughout the, uh, the watershed. Um, also dead fish. I mean, at this time of year, we're in the spring and this, the ice smell is, is uh, behind us. But if you were to see a lot of uh, dead or distressed fish, it could be something happen uh, chemically or, or something with the DO um, that's created the um, uh, fish kill. Next, please. Uh, some other things we think of some of the things that we see uh, directly next to the river and that, but um, uh, housekeeping at facilities because of our storm drains being a direct connect. Um, if you have uh, some poor housekeeping in an industrial site or um, such as everything there from that roll off box going into the storm drain, um, it's the same thing. It's just trying to um, uh, keep uh, good housekeeping to keep these materials away from storm drains or from running into running into our um, our river. Um, and again, just spills and, and illegal dumping. Those are things that that uh, that happen, um, and um, we run across those, and they need to get corrected. Um, and uh, to, in illegal dumping, what we do advise is, if you were to uh, see someone actively dumping, please don't approach them. You know, step away, get as much information, take pictures. You know, step away and and and, and call the authorities um, and report it. But yeah, don't. Don't uh, you know? Don't don't approach people. You don't you don't know who you're who you're dealing with. Um, so we can also mention misconnected floor drains. Um, is uh, any drains within the building? They should be going to the sanitary sewer. But again, you can see if anything gets dumped in that building, it's going to go into those floor drains and you know directly out into the storm sewer, which are, are things that that we don't want to have happen. Um, next, please. Okay, just a, just a rundown of the things that uh, that uh, report uh, what to report. You know, if you see something and you're not sure that it that it looks right, um, the the thing to do is we don't want you to be an expert in in what illicit discharges look like, but we want you to say yes, this looks odd. It should be reported to someone. So whether you call Sally uh, at Friends of the Rouge or um, you'll call the, 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 the numbers that we have here for the various counties and also for DEQ. Um, but we just, um, it's good just to report it and get somebody to get their eyes on it. So, and, and, Sally, and Sally and friends of the staff are great at, at communicating those to um, local units of government in the DEQ. And, and um, one of the things I do uh, for my work for Wayne County would actually be following up on, on these types of um, these types of reports so that people do when they do um get um when they do get reported people are out looking so that's that's what's important is is the eyes and ears and we appreciate the the extra the extra help and here's the numbers so who do you call um we have the eagle has their uh, 24 our emergency alert uh, system, and as well as uh, the different counties, depending on where um, where you see what's going on, they all have their various levels of of um, of uh, environmental uh, reporting. So you can you can call them as well. But you know, uh, one way or the other, we do want to, we do want you to to get in touch with folks if you see things um, uh, going on out there that uh, that uh, you feel are suspicious, or you need somebody to take a, to take a look at. And, so thank you for doing that and also being um, a volunteer and, and uh, with, uh, with uh, Friends of the Rouge and the, um, the monitoring program. We couldn't do all this without you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much. Um, Sue actually goes out and investigate these, investigates these things. And uh, as, as she said, uh, we'll help follow up with you. I've personally called these numbers, the Pease line, 
seems to be the most effective and is always staffed and they will always follow through. But again, if you see something like this and you're just not sure, feel free to call me or email me anytime um, and I can uh, help you out with it. A uh, couple things uh, actually both come from Jackie. One is Sue had mentioned um, fish kills. Uh, in the wintertime, uh, if our streams, especially our lakes, freeze really solid, we sometimes get something called winter kill. And we also have a, a type of fish called a gizzard shad that's really sensitive to temperature change. And they do, uh, if it's a really cold winter, do tend to die in mass. And you find a lot of them, um, especially along the lower rouge. So Jackie put in chat a link to some information about that with the DNR. But then Jackie also had a question for Sue. Uh, the question is, I've seen some rust and rust pipes going into the river before. Is that a concern or something to report? Um, I think the rust, it's gonna depend on if there's, if there's some um, iron in the, uh, the groundwater, if it's, if it's a steady, steady source. But if it looks like it's just that the, uh, the pipe is rusted just because of of corrosion and, and the, the infrastructure is old. Is it's, it's just something you may want to report just to the local community or uh, maybe not from an emergency issue, but just say, hey, look, this, this pipe looks like it's in really poor condition and um, report it to the local, local community as well. And we also have that, that iron bacteria that sometimes turns the water kind of rusty brown. Yes, yes, and that's, that's what I was asking in terms of it's just the pipe condition or if it's the water coming out of the pipe. Because um, again, in some areas of the watershed, um, based, on the, based on the background with the, 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 um, the soils and that is there is, there is iron, a lot of iron in the, um, in the, that, that ends up getting into the, get in the groundwater or it's coming from the pipes itself. Um, so then you're seeing that, that orangey, orangey color, which you're getting from the um, iron bacteria, which is actively, actively oxidizing the iron in the water. Great, thank you. So keep your eyes open. So, um, so that concludes the formal part of the presentation uh, for tonight. And uh, so your next step is to study those materials that I sent you. If anybody did not get that PDF, just uh, shoot me an email and I'll get it out to you. So please take a look at all of those forms, take a look at the keys, uh, read up on our sampling techniques. Um, it, the packet also includes the uh, information about what to look for and those phone numbers to call. And then, of course, we also included a membership form. So if you're not a member of Friends of the Rouge, we would highly encourage you to become one. So uh, and then if you have not signed up for um, Saturday's training, we're going to do this just uh, due to COVID. We want to limit the number of people out there. So we're doing it at 10 a.m. at one site and then a site not very far uh, beyond at noon. Um, so sign up for one of those. Uh, it's, it's also on our website. Um, and then we expect that all of you would be available for the spring bug hunt. So I expect that you've signed up for that. And uh, as a trainee, we always pair you up with an experienced person. Uh, I do have to tell you, I'm really short for team leaders this year and we've gotten a lot of publicity. In fact, some of you might've seen WXYZ, you might have even seen Aaron on there. On, Aaron, was that on Saturday? Yes, it was. It was Saturday at um, between 9 and 10. Uh, yeah, so it's also, it's on our uh, Facebook page, I think. But anyway, so she was out there telling the reporter all about bugs. So uh, we promoted the event. So we have quite a few people signed up. I really um, am limiting team sizes to six plus a couple team leaders, uh, especially during COVID. And we've limited the age of children to eight years old. We, we lowered it a little bit. We had it at 10. Um, and, you know, as, as our, our protocol now has been um, masks required at all times and social distancing. Um, 
and especially with uh, the rates of, of COVID increasing again, we're really going to hold to that. Um, and of course, in the past, we all met together in a great big room and instead all the teams will be meeting out at the site. So if you have a preference for um, a team leader to be uh, placed with or people to be on your team or uh, sites, just let me know. The registration deadline is coming up in a couple days. Uh, and once we get through that, I'll start to put the teams together. And then in addition to that, we will be going out during the week and doing a couple additional sites. So if you are, do have time during the week, uh, let me know. Sue's going to be doing that. So um, I think, is that going to be the week before or the week after, Sue? Or is that still um, to be determined? Either either, either time, depending on when um, volunteers are available. So we'll, we'll, uh, work, we'll work it out. And that is an alternative if you cannot come on the 10th um, to, to come during the week sometime. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, um, I just want to say thank you so much for um, volunteering your time, for joining the ranks of citizen science. Uh, people are doing this throughout the world and you're, you're making a, a really big difference with your, with your time and your involvement. And um, uh, I will see you on the 10th. So thank you.